I appreciate Dean's prayer, especially the part in it about enjoying each other. Now, this group here tonight, I enjoy this group. This is a wonderful group. And I appreciate everybody's presence tonight. It's so very important. I want us to go back in time to the waning days of the nation of Judah. The nation is almost done. Their last great king, Josiah, was dead. In his place, his son Jehoiakim began to reign. This is how his reign is described. In 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 36 and 37 describe his reign. 2 Kings 23, verses 36 and 37. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His, mother name, his mother's name was Zebudah, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. Our aim tonight is twofold. Number one, to see what evil the writer is talking about here that he had done. And then to see what we can learn from his life, what we can take from it. Because it's written for a reason and there are things we can learn from it. In particular, there are three things we want to look at. Number one, his reign, his rule was characterized by extortion, oppression of the poor, dishonesty, and injustice. Jeremiah the prophet lived during the time of Jehoiakim, witnessed it, and writes about it in a number of places in the book of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 22, we have a description of what that rain would have looked like if you were living there in Jerusalem. In Jeremiah chapter 22, beginning in verse 13, listen to these words. Jeremiah writes, and, of course, he's speaking by inspiration and says, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work, who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling it with silver and, or cedar and painting it with vermilion. Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord? Yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness, for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence. It says, go back and think about your father Josiah. He practiced justice. He took care of the poor and needy. He was a righteous, just person. And things went well. But he says, you are not following in the steps of your father. You're doing just the opposite. You're spending money that's not yours. You're building lavish mansions. You're more concerned about meeting your own selfish desires than helping those people in need. As king, you have a great responsibility to lead the people in the right way, and you are not doing it. You're neglecting the poor and needy. You're bribing, you're accepting bribes, you're extorting people, you're, you're wanting things done for free and not paying for them rightly. That describes the reign of Josiah's sons. What can we take from that? We have a responsibility. And by we, I mean God's people. In the book of James, we have a very familiar verse that I think has to do with our responsibility to those people around us. The very last verse of James chapter 1 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, 
and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. He says part of the kind of religion that God accepts means doing what you can for those who are less fortunate. In particular, he mentions orphans and widows, but it would include anybody who is in need. We have a responsibility. He says that's what pure religion looks like. And what I want to focus on for a minute or two is the idea that Christians are not to be on the sidelines. We're not just to be looking at the world. We're to be involved in the world. We're to be promoting what's right. We're to promote justice. Whenever we have the opportunity to promote justice, we need to do that. Whenever we have the opportunity to help in some way, those who are in need, like the poor, the, the needy, the uh, those who are oppressed, whatever, we need to, to speak out, in other words, and let our views be known. We're not to be on the sidelines. We have a responsibility. And that's practicing pure and undefiled religion. In other words, we need to get involved in the world and we need to help the world. We need to be setting the example for the world in showing what justice is like, in showing what honesty is like what helping the poor and the needy are like. So we need to be involved in making the world a better place, not just sitting on the sidelines. Unfortunately, some think that, that we just need to be uh, uh, on the sidelines and not participating in anything, and that is so untrue. There is so much good that we can do, and we need to be involved in promoting what's right. The next thing we see from Jehoiakim's reign is found in Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah 26, we'll begin reading in verse 1. And we'll see that his reign was characterized by threatening and killing the prophets who spoke the truth. Jeremiah 26, verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command you to speak to them, do not diminish a word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doings. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law, which I've set before you, to heed the words of my servants, the prophets whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not heeded, then I will make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. It says, stand and tell them the words of God. Tell them what I have said. Hopefully... Like verse says, perhaps they'll listen and turn away. Perhaps they will listen and turn away. In that same chapter, skipping down to verse 12, then Jeremiah spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you've heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings. And obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he's pronounced against you. As for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. But know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, and on its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. We read in other places where Jehoiakim caused some of these prophets to be killed. One of them was Uriah the prophet. Had him killed. Didn't want to hear the truth. More about that in a minute. In Galatians chapter 4, we have something similar that we need to listen to. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. 
Paul, in writing to these Christians in the churches of Galatia, says this, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because I tell you the truth, am I now your enemy? Some people, and this has been true throughout time, simply don't want to hear the truth. The truth makes them angry. They don't want to hear the truth. Many people didn't want to hear Jeremiah's uh, prophecy that these people were going to be in captivity 70 years. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear something that was soft and easy and pleasant to their ears. That's what they wanted to hear. But that wasn't the truth. That wasn't the truth. What they needed to hear more than anything was the truth. And that's, that is true today. We can't change the message to make people feel better. That's not the truth. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 that the Word of God, which is the truth, is able to pierce even to the dividing of soul and spirit. That Word of God is sharp. It's double-edged. It's powerful. And it's alive and it's active. But it's only powerful when it's the truth. If it's not the truth, it's not sharp. People must hear the truth above everything else. Not part of the truth or not a watered down truth, but the truth. Because that's what has the power to save the third thing from Jehoiakim's reign, the one we're going to spend the most time on, is that his reign was characterized by a disregard for God's word. Jeremiah 36, Jeremiah was commanded by God to write his prophecies on a scroll. On a scroll. Papyrus or parchment. In Jeremiah 36, <clears throat> verse 1, Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I've spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So that's what Jeremiah was told to do. Write it all down with the hope, with the purpose that maybe some of the people will turn away from their evil way. Hopefully some will do that. When we see here that there, there's a chain of inspiration. God's words to Jeremiah's mouth and then it goes to Baruch, the, the guy that transcribes it, we'll see in a minute. And it's still called the Word of God. Beginning in verse 4 of that same chapter, Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll of a book, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. You go, therefore. And read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction the words of the Lord. In the hearing of the people in the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you sh shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who come from their city. Notice what he said. Now it came from God to Jeremiah to Baruch. And even after it was written down, Baruch was to go in there and read it. And when he read it, it was still called the word of the Lord. It was still called the Word of the Lord. It didn't change. It was still inspired. It's still inspired. That's important. So the scroll was read to the people. The prince is here and they tell King Jehoiakim. They tell the king what Jeremiah has said. The king wants to see the scroll for himself. Verse 21 of the same chapter. 
So the king said, send Jehudai to bring the scroll, and he took it from Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with the fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words. He didn't like what he heard, what he read. So he would read a part. He didn't like it. He would cut it out, throw it in the fire and burn it up. Then he would have another part read. He wouldn't like that part. He would cut it out, throw it in the fire. And this went on and on and until there was nothing left. He didn't like any of it. So he had thrown the whole thing into the fire. Notice their reaction to God's word. They didn't repent. They were not afraid. They didn't tear their garments. Nothing. We go on down to verse 27. Notice now what happens. Now, after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Take yet another scroll, and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim the king of Judah has burned. And you shall say to Jehoiakim king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, You have burned this scroll saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause man and beast to cease from here? That was one of the parts he didn't like. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. I will punish him, his family, and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring on them, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and on the men of Judah, all the doom that I have pronounced against them. But they did not heed. Did not heed. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it, At the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and besides there were added to them many similar words." Just because Jehoiakim didn't like it and burned it didn't mean God's word was destroyed. There was simply another one made. God's word is truth whether people accept it or not. God's word is truth whether people like it or not. God is not concerned about whether we think the word is right or not. Because his word is perfect. The psalmist says the word is perfect converting the soul. It's only God's word that has the power to convert. So whether people accept it or not doesn't change God's word. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. And that's exactly what it is. We can't cut out portions we don't, don't like. We're even commanded and told what will happen if we do. Remember the very end of the book of Revelation says that very thing. Revelation 22, <clears throat> verse 19. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So it doesn't make any difference whether people don't like certain parts. If people are going to get rid of any of God's word, there's a price to pay for it. There's a price to pay. God calls it sin. And God says, I will wipe your name out of the book of life. So we simply don't have the right, the authority, the power to cut out any part of God's word. Makes no difference. His word's eternal. His word's eternal. It's everlasting in the heavens. 
People have tried to destroy God's word through the ages. They've not been able to do it. That's a fascinating study in and of itself. I think we see God's providence involved. His word is eternal. It's everlasting. No one will ever be able to take it away. It's that powerful. Jehoiakim had a very tragic end. Back in Jeremiah 22, we see what happened to him. Verses 18 and 19 of Jeremiah 22. Verse 18 says, Therefore thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, my brother, or alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, master, or alas, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. His end was tragic. His end was tragic. It didn't have to be tragic. All he had to do was accept what Jeremiah had told him. Accept God's word. That's all he had to do was accept it and act upon it. But because it wasn't what he wanted to hear, he lost his life and lost his soul. And that lesson is still true today. Those people, the Bible says, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, those people who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Now, that's the truth. Now, it may not be pleasant for people to hear but it's still the truth. Those who don't know God and do not obey the gospel shall be punished with everlasting destruction. And that's the ultimate tragic end. God's word will never fade away, will never pass away. It's always there. And it tells us the truth about our lives, about what we must do you or I or, or, or a committee or a group or a nation has, has no power, right, or authority to change a single word in it. The Bible clearly and simply tells one how to become a Christian. That faith and confidence, confession and baptism are all essential to one becoming a child of God. And as we saw this morning... The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved, but says that the child of God must continue to confess and ask for forgiveness. That's the truth. That's the truth. Tonight, if someone needs to obey that great invitation, we encourage you to do that as David leads us in this song. Let us stand, please.